I was at a funeral today for a beloved family member, and so what I want to talk about is in honor of him. So this is for Tom. The priest said something today that really struck me. He mentioned how dead and alive are not opposites. Most of us are definitely used to thinking that as opposites somehow, you know, black and white are opposites, tall and short, dead and alive, these are opposites. Well, the priest said they're not opposites, but it's a change in relationship, which I thought was great. And I wanted to talk about that, specifically the way I see it and the way Jesus might have mentioned it or did and the way he talked about it. But I want to start with why they're not opposites is very literally true. Recognizing that Niels Bohr, and if you've either watched some of these videos or done this group before, you've heard this, Niels Bohr said there are no opposites too. Who's Niels Bohr? Brilliant quantum physicist. He said not opposites, they're complements. That uh, short is just an absence of height and a dark is the absence of light. What we have is complements. Hermes, uh, the Hermetic teaching, it's the law of polarity. That we don't have opposites, we have degrees of difference. And so cold is the absence of heat. And so in this whole world, there's actually no opposites. It just seems like that. There's just different degree. The more light I add to the room, the less dark that I have. Dark and light are actually on just opposite poles. Same thing with life and death, as we understand it. We have dead and alive. They're not, they're not opposite, though. They're somehow on the same pole. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So, what we've got is dead and alive. And it's the one leap you have to take. It's the opposite of what we think. We, we're used to thinking of the physical person who's walking around as that which is actually alive. And that when this thing isn't walking around anymore, it's now dead. That's what we're used to saying it. Well, Jesus says stuff like, let the dead tend to the dead. What's he talking about there? He's referring to the fact that if you're walking around in the physical form, and you think this is life, you're actually dead. When he raised people from the dead, the idea is to give us the understanding and the awareness that the actual life is the spiritual self, or the soul, or the life stream, or consciousness, or mind, or anything non-physical that works for you. I put this stuff on the internet, sometimes people get sensitive about what I call it. Call it whatever you want, it's the non-physical part of yourself. But it's an extension, this physical self is an extension of that. Last week we talked about how water, in its essence, is H2O. In solid form, it's still H2O. Can, a, can an ice cube ever lose touch with its essence? No, it solidifies and now it's physical before it was liquid and now it's solid but it's still H2O the whole time. What we are is a spiritual, soul, conscious, mind, being or whatever you want to call it. We can never lose that as our essence. We're here temporarily in physical form. And if we look at it that way, we could never lose our life because this is what life is indeed John 6 63 Jesus says the flesh counts for nothing it's the spirit that gives life see we keep looking at it the wrong way we think of the physical form as life and the spirit after this is gone is what we call death it's the other way around we can't ever lose that which is the spirit that's the thing that gives us life that's John 6 63 now another form of opposites we think in terms of a hard and easy. Isn't easy the opposite of hard? Well, I like to say there's a, there's a hard way to look at Christianity. There's also a hard way to experience Christianity in some of Jesus' teachings. And there's an easy aspect to it, too. These are not opposites. They're actually complements. They work together. There's an aspect of what we're talking about that's very hard. And there's an aspect of what we're talking about that's very easy. And so let's go through some examples. There are those who believe that all I have to do to be a Christian is to accept Jesus as my Savior. In a way, that's right. But as long as I go with all the things that he teaches, which we're about to go through, then I've accepted him and I truly believe him. But the stuff he teaches is really hard to do. So it's an easy concept, accepting him as my Lord and Savior, but it's really hard to do all the things that he says to do. And remember, Matthew 5, 48, he says you must be perfect which means we got to do these things that he says. So let's look at some of the things that he says that are very hard, but if we can do them, it'll help us understand that which we really are. In Matthew 10, 34, he says, Do not think I came to bring peace to the earth. I came to bring a sword. I came to separate you from your family. 
That's hard. That also sounds harsh. He didn't come to bring peace. We often think of him as the Prince of Peace. Well, there's another opposite, right? Is he the Prince of the Peace or is he not a Prince of the Peace? Well, he said he didn't come to bring peace. Why? Because it's very hard to separate them from that which we think we are. He says, for I have come to set a, a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a, and a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. Man's foes will be those of his, of his own household. Wow, that means we're going to have some friction inside of our house, right? Families, it's going to be very difficult. Why? Because we see families as physical primarily. That's the first way we see them, physical beings. It's, a hard, it's very hard to see a family member as a spiritual being, and yet that's what they are. But we fall in love or work with the physical part of self. And then he goes on, whoever loves father and mother more than me cannot be my disciple. Because if what we're doing is worshiping the physical aspects of the spiritual self, and we're looking at that first, we're going to see life and death differently. We're also not going to experience the liberation of what it, what it is to see oneself as, as a, a spiritual being. We can't follow Christ into this place if we see ourselves as physical. And then he says, whoever loses his life will find his life, and whoever finds his life will lose his life. Well, that's a weird contradiction, so it sounds. What's he talking about? Whoever loses this life will find this life. Whoever loses this life finds this life. See, he's talking about the polarity. He's talking about the complementarity. The fact is, is if this is what you think you are, you're going to lose this. If this is what you think you are, you're going to lose this. See how they go hand in hand? Now, this is hard to do. Because, first of all, he didn't come to bring peace. He came to make this difficult on you so we can break free from that which is the addiction to the physical self. And those who choose the spiritual path have to do that. If that's not enough, he says in Luke 14, 26, those who do not hate their mother and father and sister and brother and children and hate their own life can't be my disciple. Wow, that's aggressive stuff we don't hear very often. He didn't come to bring peace. He came to tell us, if you don't hate that which is your family, he said it, look, look it up. Uh, Luke 14, 26. If you don't hate your family, you can't be my disciple. Now, I'd like to say Jesus didn't speak English. You look it up, the word hate in this context is more preferential. You have to first see yourself as a spiritual being in order for this to work. It's super hard to lose a loved one when you think of yourself as flesh. Well, what if you think of yourself as a preferred being that you are, as a spiritual being, and you see your loved ones as a spiritual being? Now, that's a game changer. And there's what the priest is talking about. Your, your relationship has changed. And if that spiritual being can go on, energy cannot be destroyed. If, that's, if that consciousness is, goes on, if that soul goes on, or that life stream goes on, guess what? You can see them again. Your relationship has definitely changed, though. This is why we need to actually hate our family. That means we have to prefer that which is the spiritual part of them. It's so much better to see each other as spiritual beings first and then physical. And that's all he's saying there. He doesn't want us to go disrespect people. He's talking about preferences. So let's go to the easy side for a minute. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we are told by Apostle Paul that through grace alone ye are saved. And that this is not of yourself or of your own doing. Talk about easy. You don't have to earn your way into heaven. You don't have to earn your way beyond death into some spiritual place. You've already got it. That's grace. It was already given to you. You just have to have that awareness. It's really as simple as understanding 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's just a concept. And the concept that you're a spiritual being, boom, grace, automatic. That's it. Shift in consciousness. That's it. Just that shift. From this to that. And just that shift is enough. Through grace alone you are saved. And this is not of yourself. Nobody's going to earn this. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You just have to understand it. In Luke 23, 34, he says, Forgive them, they know not what they do. What a powerful shift in consciousness there. To recognize that this is a hard game. This is hard to break up with the, our addiction to the flesh. And all of us get addicted to something. And in the flesh, we often get addicted to family members. And, it's, and friends, and all our loved ones that pass. Boy, it's hard to let that go. What if they didn't actually die? What if they're just on the other side, quite literally, more alive? The Tibetan Book of the Dead says, upon death, you are nine times more conscious. 
you're actually more alive on the other side. Remember, we're, this, the flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. If this consciousness, in the, in, the, in the simplest terms, if it's just your mind looking at it this way, liberates you. And it doesn't take much, other than a shift in consciousness, to look at ourselves as a non-physical energy conscious being. And that's through grace alone. And then it comes automatically. Then you go, oh my, I can feel the presence of my loved one. They didn't actually die. They're still very much alive. Remember in Genesis it says that Adam was sent into a deep sleep. Well, he was in a deep sleep, and that's what this side of the board is, to be asleep. What does it mean to wake up? To realize that you are born again of spirit. Jesus comes along to teach us this. He overcame the grave by saying, I'm not dying. In fact, he chastised Peter for that exact thing. Peter wanted to save his life, and Jesus says, come on, Peter. Satan, get behind me. You're focused on the affairs of man. I'm focused on the affairs of God. You are a spiritual being, you're not a physical being. I can't die. In fact, watch me. I'm going to die, and then I'm going to come back three days later, and then I'm going to leave again. Okay? That's what he's trying to show us, how to overcome death. You do that by realizing you're not the body. That which is your mind or your soul or your life stream is animating your body right now. But it's like taking off this jacket. That's what death is. I don't need to have a funeral for my laundry. Spiritually speaking, nothing can die. Spirit can't die. This is hard and easy at the same time. John 3.30. When John says, I must decrease so he may increase. This is the one of the hardest things to do. Decrease oneself. In psychological and some spiritual terms, that's what's called the ego. Okay? The idea of an I. And that must decrease. This thing called Steve, physical self, white American dude. I must decrease my emphasis on that. Crucify it. I must crucify it. And the resurrection comes after that. The awareness of who I truly am. I must decrease that which is Steve so that which is Christ can increase inside of me. I'd much rather think like that than like Steve does because Steve has screwed up a lot. But so I call John 3.30 both difficult and easy at the same time because the decreasing of self leads to the increasing of the true self. In Luke 23, 34, when Jesus says, Forgive them, they know not what they do, it's a reference to how difficult this is. People are walking around physically focused in a physical world because it sure looks like that. Einstein and friends describe the world as illusion somehow. It's the other side of the veil, if you will. It's very difficult, but it's done out of ignorance when we make mistakes. That's what, forgive them, they know not what they do means. It's a very difficult game we're playing. Forgiveness, when it comes right down to it, pretty simple. When you see it the right way, it's just releasing. It's letting go. It doesn't mean letting people out of jail, although it might. It doesn't mean baking a cake for the neighbor after they stole your TV, although it might. What it means is releasing ourselves from ignorance. The idea of the flesh as life is ignorant, and we can release ourselves from that. That's forgiveness. We can also release other people from the stuff they've done to us out of ignorance, and vice versa, and the stuff we've done to ourselves. Because all the dysfunctional things we do are done by thinking of ourselves physically. If we think of ourselves spiritually, it's a game changer. Again, there is no label or identity associated with the spiritual self. Gender disappears over here. Race disappears over here. Political affiliation. Religion. The fact is, it's the Spirit that gives life, and Jesus emanated the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within, in the form of what we know as Christ. And there's the teaching. Revelation 3.21. One who has conquered can sit with me on the throne. Well, what are we supposed to conquer? Just the idea of the false self. You're a spiritual self. You're a, a mental being. You're a... A, an eternal life stream. And if you conquer this thing called the ego, which is what the devil is, or how the devil works through us, it's a physical focus. It's an addiction to the physical world. It's the reason for all our pain. I must control my physical world. This must go the way I want it to. If it doesn't go the way I want it to, I'm going to feel pain. That's called attachment. It also happens to be the noble truths in Buddhism. If you're attached to something, you're going to have pain. If you detach or let go, you're released from the pain. No more suffering. Well, we have pain when we're attached to the physical self. 
We cause pain because we say, oh no, someone just died. Now, that's not to say it's not sad. You might be watching a movie you're enjoying, and when it ends, you might be sad. That was such a good movie. And you surely can love a human being, and when they die, it's sad. That's not the same as suffering. I can know that they're a spiritual being and still be sad. But that doesn't make me dysfunctional. It's part of the human experience. The suffering comes in when I think it's the end, and I think it was unfair, and that there is no afterlife, and all of the pain comes from that. So Jesus addresses this directly in Matthew 11.30. He says, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's about the only time in all the spiritual texts that I've read and come across, and all the Dharma, that I've come across the word easy. Jesus specifically says that his yoke is easy. What is the yoke? The yoke is the thing you put on the horse or the ox to attach to the cart to go through your life, right? Or to carry things along in the physical world. That's the yoke. And he says it's easy, meaning it's comfortable. He's referring to the Christ self. He's referring to the spiritual self. It's so much easier to look at the world this way. To look at the world as fair somehow. To look at the world as an eternal place yeah. or the physical world is temporary and that death is a thing that we all have to go through. And yet the spiritual self is always present, it's always there, that's so much easier to look at life and it's also so much easier to work out your own salvation as Paul says. It's actually easier when Jesus teaches don't worry about the speck in your neighbor's eye when you have a log in your own. It's so difficult to help others remove their specks. For the most part, they don't want it. Go up to somebody with something in the eye and start picking at their eye. Very few people want you to fix them, really, if any. And so what Jesus teach? Don't worry about everybody else's issues. Work on your issues. Very, very clear. And I love to point out Buddha, who came 500 years before Jesus, so he didn't have the luxury of Jesus as a teacher. Buddha said, strive for your own liberation with diligence. The exact same teaching. Very, very obviously the same truth which means work on yourself. And what is it you have to do? What is the burden is light aspect of this? You could put it all down. From the Ephesians verse, there's nothing you need to do to earn your way anywhere. It's already given to you. You just have to realize it. And we know death is coming. And if there turns out to be an afterlife, what are you going to have to do? You're just going to experience it. Just know that now. That's the awakening. The Book of the Dead says... Recognition and liberation are simultaneous. Just recognize this is true. You're liberated. You're free. Now, you can realize that other people might not be working on this. It's not your job to change them. Work out your own salvation is for you to figure that out. It's so much easier to do it this way. We're caught up in a world where so many people are trying to convince other people to see the world the way they see it. And yet all the prophets come and say, well, if you just focus on yourself, it'll be so much easier. And it is way easier for me to work on me. And so ultimately, the most easy thing in the world, the thing that's most freeing, is to realize you're the spiritual being. It's so hard and painful and suffering to think of myself as a physical being who's going to die, and that might be it, and I might not see my loved ones again. That's very painful. But to truly, authentically know our loved ones are still present in the world. They're still present in the uh, samsara. They're still present in the universe. There's a heaven, and these, these words mean different things to different people. But to know that's true is something you can hold on to yourself, and it doesn't, you don't need anybody else to agree with you. You're now free. You're now liberated. It's hard work to do that, but it's ultimately the easiest thing. There is no death. Alive and death are not opposites, because we're eternally alive. And what we're experiencing is just a temporary extension. There is no hard thing going on if you just tap into the easy. And if you stay there, it's the most peaceful thing that there can be. Now, staying there is difficult. And yet, if you look at it that way, it's liberating. It's the most freeing, easy thing we could possibly do.